Do you feel the vibes? What's up everybody and welcome to The Recreational Engineer. This video is going to mark the first installment of this multi-part series on building a quadcopter. In these videos we're going to go right from start to finish with the whole process covering the inception of the initial design all the way to manufacturing and testing. Before we get into things too quickly I want to give a quick recap of how this all happened in the first place. So a couple of months ago a friend of mine casually mentioned that he was looking into building his own quadcopter from scratch and when he told me about all this, I got super intrigued about the whole thing because it just sounded like something that would be ridiculously complicated to do on your own. So we got to talking about how he was going to approach the whole problem and he showed me that there's actually a really big community of hobbyists that do this already. And it turned out that most of the complicated electronics existed as open source hardware already, making them really easy and cheap to implement. So needless to say, I knew that I really had to try this myself. But seeing as this conversation went down in our graduate research lab, it seemed like several of my friends had the same idea. So being the competitive group of guys that we are, uh, we had the idea of coming up with a little bit of a competition. So we went over and we made some ground rules. We decided to set the cap of the project at no more than $600. And then we decided on three distinct events. No competition is complete without a top speed. So we're going to be testing for that. And of course, speed is useless without good handling, so we're going to have a maneuverability course. And of course, we all want to see how much power these things can put down, so we're going to have a maximum payload and lifting competition. So I decided this would be an awesome opportunity to make a video series that would follow this from start to finish. I'll go over all of my design decisions and logic, as well as all of the components well enough for you to do this on your own. So let's get started by going over some of the basic components that we're going to need for this project. So just like a computer needs a processor to complete calculations, a quadcopter needs a flight controller in order to stay in the air. The flight controller is a small integrated circuit that has an accelerometer and a gyroscope that it uses to keep track of its orientation. It uses this information from the sensors to calculate how much power to send to each motor in order to do what the pilot wants, such as move from side to side or increase in altitude. Some flight controllers even come with GPS capability which allows them to hold a position during windy conditions without any input from the user. This is of course particularly useful for filming applications. When it comes down to choosing a flight controller, the amount of options in the market can make the process a tad overwhelming. In order to make things easier, I have narrowed this down to three options that I believe would be suitable for a variety of builds. The first on this list is the OpenPilot CC3D. This controller is an extremely common amongst hobbyists, um, and it's a very high quality product. This controller typically is reserved for acrobatic quads, although newer versions allow for the attachment of an external GPS module, which would also make it very applicable for filming applications. This controller can be had in a bare bones form for just $15, making it extremely affordable for almost any build. The next step on our list is the DJI NASA Lite and MV2 controllers. If you recognize the name DJI, it's because they're the company who produced the extremely iconic Phantom series of quadcopters. They offer an extremely high quality product with many fantastic features. Their MV2 controller has a GPS based positional hold ability as well as something they call return to home, which allows it to return back to the launch site whenever it loses signal. Unfortunately, with this boatload of features comes a price that's really ready to back it up with the Lite and MV2 coming in at $150 and $300 respectively. The NAS32 has often been said to be the cause of the decrease in popularity of the once supreme CC3D. It offers a similar 32-bit architecture but with a slightly better MPU6050 sensor when compared to the MPU6000 found in the CC3D. The NAS32 is slightly more expensive than the CC3D but it's still a great deal at only $25 making it still an extremely affordable option. The NACE 32's very comp uh, compact size also makes it a popular choice for smaller FPV racing quads. Another huge benefit to the NACE 32 is the large community that backs it. It makes finding support for issues a breeze. Another benefit to this community is the continual development of firmware and great software for tuning such as OpenPilot. All of these controllers will require some type of setup using a PC, but we'll touch on that in the coming installments. Personally, I'm quite fond of the NACE 32, and it's the controller that we're going to be using in this build. So now that we have our flight controller chosen, we need to consider what it's going to be communicating with. When it comes to overwhelming amounts of choice, transmitters and receivers take the top spot. Choices range anywhere from something like this super basic $20 unit with four channels and a pretty rudimentary display to something like this nine channel Turnigy model. 
This is the Turnigy 9X. It's an entry-level radio that I purchased off of Hobby King for around $80. It has everything that we're going to need to control this quad, plus some extra channels. And these can allow us to control things like a camera gimbal if we decide to go that road in the future. One of the features that really sold me on the 9X was the ability to tune the gains and the expon exponential response on each of the channels through this on-screen display. What that means is it allows us to tune certain areas of the control. This first area could be a relative dead zone, not causing a lot of response. But as we work our way further up into the channel, we get a much, much larger change in, in power. And that makes things like really snappy quads easier to control. The 9X also comes with an included RF module, which is swappable, uh, and also includes an 8-channel receiver. To be honest, I'm not really sure why Hobby King would sell a 9-channel transmitter and bundle it with an 8-channel receiver, but I doubt I'd be able to use all 8 channels anyways. Overall, the Turnigy 9X is a fantastic beginner radio, and it's what we're going to be using for our project. So now that we have our two main electronics chosen, our flight controller, the NACE32, coming in at $25, and the Turnigy 9X, our transmitter and receiver, coming in at about $80, that leaves us with $475 left on our budget, and this should be plenty of room. The reason I started this series out by choosing the flight controller and the radio is because regardless of how big or small we make the quad, the choice of these components is really down to preference and budget. Components like the motors and batteries need to be chosen with the consideration of the system as a whole. In the next installment, we'll be going over to the design and construction of the prototype chassis. We'll be roughing it out in SolidWorks and manufacturing some of the key components in the machine shop. Thanks for tuning in to part one of Building a Quadcopter, and I'll catch you guys all in the next segment. Do you feel the